my great pleasure, though, today to welcome you to the 2019 Diana and Simon Rabb Writer in Residence event. Uh, this Writer in Residence program has enabled us to bring the most creative contemporary practitioners of the literary arts to campus to participate in programs like today's reading and to meet more informally with UCSB creative writing students. Diana Rabb is herself an award-winning memoirist, memoirist, poet, editor, and blogger. Her publications include two memoirs, Regina's Closet, Finding My Grandmother's Secret Journal, and Healing with Words, and numerous books of poetry. She has also edited two anthologies about writers on writing. And it is my great, great, great pleasure to introduce this year's Rob Writer in Residence, poet Tyree Day. Day is the author of two poetry collections, River Hymns, which is the 2017 APR Hanukkah First Book Prize winner, and Cardinal, which is forthcoming from Coffer Canyon Press in 2020. His work has also been published in numerous newspapers and literary magazines, including Prairie Schooner, The New York Times, and The National Review. In 2017, he was a Ruth Lilly finalist and a Kaveh Khanum Fellow. He was also a Kate Tufts Poetry Award finalist. And in 2019, he won the Palm Beach Poetry Festival Langston Hughes Fellowship. Most recently, he was awarded a Whiting Award, which is a prestigious literary prize given to the most promising of emerging creative writers. Tyree Day earned his BA in English and his MFA with a concentration in poetry, both from North Carolina State University. Uh, and in 2018, he was an assistant professor of English at St. Augustine University. He has also taught at Lewisburg College. Tyree Day has been described as, quote, a, po a poet of extraordinary ability and surprise, and also as a blues poet of the first order a poet who is working in the vernacular of a man speaking out loud to his own soul. I am grateful to Tyree Day for giving us the opportunity to hear the live music of his poetry this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming him. Fall on my knees, 
ask her how she doing, how long is her hair now, does she still like it braided in front, still like having her scalp scratched, what y'all doing in heaven today? She tell my mama, don't let a bird get the hair that falls out your head, they'll use it to build a nest and you'll never leave Roseville. Dirt is the only thing I know that can't die. It makes sense, we were buried here, makes sense, Mama don't want me playing in it. Uh, if you're going to be at my workshop tomorrow, we're going to talk about uh, the, the connection between narrative and image, right? Uh, so my narrative is that I'm black, probably tell I'm Southern, uh, raised by a single mother, working class family, right? So because that is my narrative, certain symbols show up in my work, right? Tobacco fields, rivers, uh, it's connected to religion. So, because I know my symbols and I know my narrative, I can make my symbols new, right? I can break them open, I can tell them what to them, right? We're going to talk about this tomorrow in the workshop. Let's just have it in your head tonight. You can think about it if you're in the workshop. What is your narrative, right? What is your current narrative? Your narrative will change as you get older, right? But what is your current narrative? Tones. Even the dust that lifted off the fields had something to say. I listened. Even the grass spoke. We turned the woods behind my house into a playground. The men that slept there, these keepers, their matted blankets, new ground. Our day was measured in how far away from home we could get. Our mothers took care of our tongues when we only wanted sugar, pixie sticks, and caramel pieces. Death never stopped mourning. Licked our collarbones like they were covered in powdered sugar. Death was never a child. Always had to think of others first. Before we knew what our bodies were worth, we made wounds the way the sky made blue. The first time I saw a rabbit eat its young, I thank God for my mother. Another thing I'm going to talk about in workshop tomorrow. So, um, you've all been to a pool, right? Swam in the pool, yes? On the ocean, right? Uh, so, if you ever play this game, you might play it with friends, cousins, where you go in the water and see you can hold their breath for longest, yes? You want to play this game? So, you can think about the interior architecture of a poem working this way. Uh, and you can think about my poems working this way. So, when you go on the water, right, that's the images of the poem, right? When you come up and take that deep breath, that's you making meaning or giving identity to these images. Uh, I'll give you poem examples tomorrow when we look at this, right? Uh, but you can think, this is the architecture of a poem. Poets do that. They, they either constantly, maybe they stay on the water the whole time and stuff, but images, images. Images, right? Uh, you think of a poet like Eduardo C. Corral does this. Uh, and then there's poets that, that may stay on the water for half the poem and then come up and take that deep breath. And then so all these images before we get the identity connected to them, right? We know why these images mean so much to this poet. And that's kind of how my poems work as well. Uh, another poet that does this is Dorian Locks, whose new book just came out uh, only as a day is long. You should go read it. When my mother had the world on her mind, crickets in her ear. One, boy, don't let a shadow in you. I never want to see the devil in your eyes, a traceable line of your daddy's. Two, if you dream about fish or a river, somebody's pregnant, we need the water more than it needs us. Three, dream about snakes, you haven't been living right. Wash your hands of it. Four, they are shooting boys who look like you. You know my number. Use it. Keep all your blood. Five, stay. Six, alive. Barely walk, 
walk across the street, very much in pity, maybe it's a little sadness, right? Uh, so you would never hear someone say, I am, I am as happy as a wingless baby who can barely walk across the floor, right? So that's how emotion, right, is connected to image, right? Um, if you see a wingless baby chick, you're evoking a type of image, right? So these three things must be working together to make a whole. All right. For a kid, death happens like this. Your mother is not watching young and restless, but sits in a quiet, dark living room. She won't care that your bed has gone unmade for three days. Sheets in a sour ball in the corner, the carton of milk ground as your cousin's belly. Outside, you place your ear to the ground, hear the ants marching to a cadence of the dead, the dead, but to them, it sounds like sugar. If anyone ever catches you near the two liquor houses that almost touch like second cousins, your mother will beat you sky color. Suddenly, like rain, your father arrives, takes you outside in the gravel driveway to look under the hood of his green trunk. You stare at the bones of his wrist, his nose snub like yours. He asks you past the tool, says that's a flathead, not a Phillips. The cancer in your grandmother's kidneys never whisper. It grabbed the mic and started yelling, the dead, the dead, the a deacon for dialysis, for insulin, for water. You remember them all around her bed. Your mother, your father's sisters you barely knew. The father you wanted, like your littlest cousins, wanted ponies with blonde hair. All right, we get to the new poems. Talk about those in a second. Uh, this is the last poem in the River Hymns. I'd like to end with this poem uh, Say River, Sea River. I threw up the river last night. Trout already gutted, salamanders rocking between the boats on my bedroom floor. Then the river stood up, bow legged, it walked like it was drunk, like it was an uncle. So I followed the dizzy river into my mother's backyard. Watched it fall and flood the houses, pick itself up, laugh it off. We splashed past where the men laid on the ground, their low eyes always where they laid at night. I wondered if they counted the stars together until it turned into a lightning hopkins song. 21, 22, my black dog blues. If they played spades with planets, toasted wild Irish rows to the seven sisters. The river took me to a big graveyard. We didn't cut through, funnel around, ran a damp finger along the fence. The river would catch a name as we passed the straight stones, and every so often say one, Phillips, Jones. The dead heard the wet voice and started calling back, River. Oh, so those, those are River Hymn poems. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. It's so hard reading old poems because you know, you're not, I'm necessarily not this person anymore, you know? So when I like have a step back in those shoes, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, though I'm very grateful to be here to read you and I won't come back and read to you anytime, right? Uh, but that's, I think all artists go through this, right? Uh, I'm sure Beyonce is not happy when she just sit on that sketch out. So maybe, you gotta move on, right? So, uh, so Cardinal, uh, Cardinal will be out with Complicated in 2020. It's due December 1st. Uh, I'm going to make this deadline. Keep telling myself that. Uh, it's there. Need a little more tweaking. I'm, uh, I'm adding family photos. Uh, first, I should tell you. So Cardinal explores. It's, it, it explores this migration of a family, also explores this migration of a speaker, and it also deals with narratives around the Great Migration. Uh, if you don't know the Great Migration is, you should go look at it up later, right? Um, so it's dealing with all these narratives, and I wanted, I have all these family photos from us going to like family reunions, you know, we all got the family reunion shirts and shit on. Um, so I wanted to add those photos, but I want to put masks over there. So I'm working with a friend who's a graphic designer to make it not corny, because right now it sounds really corny, I know, but it's going to be really good. All right, so, 
So here are a few poems from Carlo. Uh, poets in here, the Ruth Lilly application is Tuesday, deadline, Poetry Foundation. It's free to apply. Uh, anyone under 31 can apply. It's $25,000. 10 poems and a personal statement. Okay? Apply. Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, miles and miles above my head. My grandmother, an unworkable field full of shooting stars. In the soil of that field is everything this family needs to turn our traumas into river current, our children together, our names, and cook a thousand birds to celebrate. My grandmother is a stone in my throat, my mouth full of old water. She died before I knew to remember her favorite sky. I've never asked her a question, and I don't know the sound her tone makes in the wind. I want to draw the soil under her feet in the last place she stood. I wish like I've never been disappointed by the devotion the dead have for being dead, by how easily they appear in a god before the sky changes in April, my uncle died in his sleep. I was six, and I had my grandmother's toes sunken into wet sand under a waiting starless night, his death celestial, a death crowded with stars. Then I thought dying and sleeping were the same. Both stood on the same spot in my mind, the body knew his stars once were. My grandfather built tombstones to sit on top of cooks and maids they buried from here to Georgia, and he never hid his workers' hands. He spoke with bright white eyes that my mother looked up into, watched him bloom, then wilt away like a squash vine's flower, I know them. Ode to Sets. Some nights, my grandparents lay in a room listening to their legs rub together a sound like pulling squash for his vine, two bodies unraveling and rolling down a hill. Some nights, they were so tired they lay there not moving like flooded field crickets, his hands still making tombstones hours after leaving his job and the new he did. Some nights, she didn't care if all the children still wandered around the house. She wanted him to hold the moon in place with his sliced and tattered hands. Final pose. The last black barn owls scoring summer was scoring summer. The little smoke you smell rising from a birthing burn pile went straight to heaven as only smoke can do. I watch you pose with one hand on your hip like some unqualified angel. The last horseshoes were spinning around the still stake. The still stake was beaten into the patched dirt. The dirt was ready and sounded like a drum. The past didn't want you to leave. It loved you so damn much. I wanted to be the grass because it felt you lay it down. I wanted to be the dirt holding you while holding me being the grass, selfish as I am for your forever, telling me to look up. The sky has filled with the desert the wind can't clear. From which I flew. How many poems is that? One, two, three, okay. From which I flew. Only together holding hands in silence can I see what a field has done to my mother, aunts, and uncles. The land around my grandmother's old tin roof has changed. I doubt she recognized it from above. How many black birds does it take to live in a house? Our grandma living, you wake your dead. We have nowhere to go, but we're leaving anyhow by many ways. When they ask why you want to fly, Blackbird, say, I want to leave the South because it killed the first man I love. There's so much more killing. Say my son's name. His death was the first thing to break me in and fly me through town. If grief has a body, it wears his Dodgers cap and still walks to the corner store to buy lottery tickets and Budweiser 40s. I don't like what I have to be here to be. All the black birds with nowhere to go keep leaving. All right, y'all, last poem. It's a dead grandmother poem.
that's not going to use that one now. So maybe it won't be the last one. We'll see how I feel after I read it. Because I got a poem. Actually, yeah, it won't be the last one. Leave yourself all over. This is a, uh, a line taken from Adeseli's Vermont. You all should be an amazing poet. I just left the workshop uh, with him in Florida. Uh, we were talking about this idea of strangeness. And if so, if you're a poet, you know what the term white space means. So uh, usually, white space is a moment in a poem for silence. But uh, her whole, she was talking about, her whole workshop was kind of turning white space into rain. So taking white space from silence and making it rain, which I still don't have no idea how to do, but I just love thinking about that. We also talked a lot about time. Uh, I'm really interested in time, because poet poems, you know, they're our entryway into time travel, right? I'm pretty sure the scientists want to figure out how to time travel. They can go back and read some poems. I'm pretty sure the answer's in there. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, so her line is the title of this poem. OK, Leave Yourself All Over for Grandmother Carrie. Teach me to love the way only the dead know. Sometimes I want to see you so badly I dream myself full of the reddest wings. I do the things I promised my mother I'd never do again. You wouldn't recognize me now or the town. Three highways run through old tobacco land. I weep all night for you, will not stop, no matter the bright purple festivals, the fireworks that scare everything from the sky. On the way to visit your grave, where you're buried beside your lonesome son, who walked Youngsville all day like an angel no one would give proper wings. I wanted to see you in that small town where our last name watered a crop of soybeans labored under a white man's promise. I wanted to see you, I wanted to see you in that wide graveyard as a cardinal. When I arrived, I wanted there to be Jubilee, chalk red feathers darting the sky like a little blood moon. I think I'll never be through with the dead my altar full of whole other worlds. When you no longer ghost among your children, grandchildren, when you become fully angel, a bird I let loose in my house, will you still remember us and our Jerry Rig lives? I know it's hard being dead. Okay, last poem. Good question. Uh, by land. Not B-Y, but by land. My land. I lived on dirt roads that bent and ended at a gate of pines. The dust skipped up, did it make my mother look like a dream? I lived on roads that dragged through America, I've only paced them to the next town. The road we kissed on is gone, rich folks buying up all the city in which we make do. I miss when Sonny could do a willy all the way down Person Street and no one would call the police because he was a part of the neighborhood like the honeysuckle bush between two yards and he was beautiful, not like a horse standing alone in a yellow field, but like a man is beautiful. Most of the little towns have a road nicknamed Devil's Turn where someone's brother died on a Saturday night while Nina sang Tell Me More and More and then some on the caddies radio, the moon the color of the oldest cardinal. Every road isn't a way out. Some circle back like a wolf. You can't get lost on them, and they won't lose you. Others wait for you to run out of gas and come alive with your mother, with what your mother said would take you. Every road promises something like a father. But when you arrive, the town is empty, and you wait like a good child, questioning everything, the road itself laughing like a drunk man falling into a roadside ditch. The road I'm walking now is howling and full of moon. Hopefully, it will lead to myself. Hopefully, they'll take me home. Thank you. What is your writing process like? My writing process, uh, it's a lot of reading, a lot of stealing. Poets steal the poems, right? Uh, as long as you write, honor them in the back of the book, the notes, but still, still, still. Uh, 
right now, so I usually have a couple of books on me that I'm reading through. Um, so it's like 90 percent reading, 10 percent writing. Uh, uh, and for me, I tell people to find the best time for them when they're most like when they're their most emotional. For me, it's at night. Uh, that's when I tend to write. Uh, that, that changed throughout years. Before I was an early morning writer, but as I get older, I seem like you can't do it in the morning. So you write poems? Uh, yeah. Uh, a little bit, yeah. I right. submitted to a magazine. That's you know, easy to do. Yes. What's your writing process like? Um, drinking a lot of coffee late at night. But in the end I just stumble on a lot of just fall asleep. Okay. Alright, uh, so this is what you should do. You should get yourself this is going to take a while, but just read as much as you can to get you like five foundation writers where you can find uh, your kind of poetic theory, how you think your poems work, and those let those kind of lead you, you know what I mean? Because they probably taught someone, and they probably taught someone, you can just follow that lineage. That Thank you. Yeah. Yes? How was your path to getting where you are today? My path? Oh, God, it was terrible. So, uh, no, nah, not terrible. Like, I, didn't I was never the best in school. Uh, so I found out my like junior year in high school that you can major in creative writing. Right? Uh, so North Carolina, if you don't know about North Carolina school system, it's not the best. Uh, so I was passed along for much of my uh, grade school. And I didn't realize this is my senior year that actually when I had to write a double space paper. And I thought double space meant two spaces between every word, right? That's literally how, like, past the moment I was. Um, and so I found out you could major in creative writing. Uh, I went to Elizabeth City State in North Carolina my first year. Then I transferred over to, uh, to North Carolina State just to be closer to home. Uh, I met the poet Dorian Locks, who's my mentor, teacher, slash poetry mom. Uh, who really guided me. Uh, I flunked out a semester in NC State, came back at the time when it was like, all right, Terry, you know, you're, you're going into debt for this, right? You might want to set it up. Uh, and so I kind of just followed poetry, you know, uh, reading a lot. I wasn't interested in the MFA program. I thought, I got a BA in career right, I'm going to get a job for that, right? It's a joke. Um, <laughs> So I did an MFA program at NC State, and my, um, so this is my thesis, right? You have to have 50 poems, and then you defend them, but I was brave enough to send it out to a contest, and I guess here I am now, man. That's, that's the story of the chase Yes? Is it hard to write poetry when a poem is efficient enough? No. Uh, I am still, I, I, this should be for everybody. You should have like four people that you trust with your work. Um, you should also be able to know like certain poems should go to certain people. So, Dorian Locks looks at my poems, Eduardo Corral, Joseph Millar, and then I may send one over, uh, I send work to Dinez, trust Dinez more, you know, the poet Dinez Smith. Uh, and then I kind of go off what they say. I'm really bad at determining when the poem's done. Usually I can tell. Uh, here's a good note. Try to end a poem with an image. Also think about the ending of the poem that's not just like, ah, you want a poem to end like a bell. It rings off and just goes off, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you got to have people. That's all art. Everybody has to pull the trigger. And that's how you make great art. You need other voices. You can't see everything, you know. Yes. Uh, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned that reading that um, I guess the book that you wrote that was hard for you because it changed. If it's not too personal to ask, like what um, what particular has like changed about you? Literally, I'm just a whole different person. My poetic style has changed. So if you look at this book, my lines are more forward. Uh, I'm more interested in. I'm more interested in the lyric. These poems are very narrative, though I'm going to always write narrative poems. I'm, I'm interested in, 
taking, right now I'm interested in taking the English, English language and fucking it up to it can no longer even read it, but it still has an emotional reach to you. That's the moment I'm at right now. Though Cardinal does this a lot, though it's still very there, though there are a lot of lyric, lyrical moments that's, that's trying to trying to take the English language full of traumas, right? And create something new from it, something that so I was in this workshop with Addison and we was talking about like the language I use is the same language that like kept a lot of my people captive. So now I'm interested in fucking all up and making it something else. I kind of saw some stuff. <laughs> yes. Did you say your world of poetry is more on the reality side or more towards imagination? Well, oh, man, magic. Magic all day. Uh, Trying to think, like all the poets I know, magic is such an important part of poetry. It's the imagination, is literally that unconscious sparks me. Uh, I'm trying to draw a poet that's like also just like nothing but reality. I can't think of that poet. It also sounds like I did myself. Uh, no, I'm sure there's a poet. I, I don't know a poet that doesn't have magic in the world. Like magic is such an important part of poetry. In mythology, right? A lot of poets are writing, they're writing about the mythology of their families, right? So that, that magic is, I think, the greatest thing. I think so, so once you start playing with language, magic is just going to come out of them. You right? Not really. All right. I don't think you were recording. Did you guys have a mic? Yes. I can be loud. Um, you talk about, yeah, it's okay. Can you talk about like your revision process? Do you revise a lot? A lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, so uh, a lot of folks work different ways. For me, once I change the line, it's changed forever. I don't keep multiple drafts. That was just driving me insane. But for me, I, I, I overwrite, 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 and then I go back and try to get down to the bare bones of what I need. Uh, also, here's a good, good mode for you to, if you question the line, whether it's good or not, cut it. Because someone else is going to question it for sure. Uh, slim, if you look at these books, my poems are always slim. I try to cut, 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 right? Um, risk, risk uh, being over emotional, uh, risk it all. Uh, you can cut it back later. Um, also, remember, it's, it's intuition over intention. Don't ever sit down with a poem like this is a poem about the time you said it's going to suck, right? Intuition. And that comes just from reading. It's just like how I like to think about it. Uh, jazz musicians, right? Well, they're not just playing random notes. This is from years of practice. So once you read a lot, that intuition you know, just starts to grow. Wait, so what was your question again? I need to think of that. So yeah, what was 
Oh, blues poet. So the blues, right? The blues has the right. Uh, the blues has the sorrow, but also joyful, right? You can also think about gospel. You can also think about when any time Nina Simone sings a song, right? Um, it's that quality, I think, uh, that Jericho may be talking about. But I like the term blues poet, uh, though I haven't really explored. Also, I just know the tradition of uh, so, Yes. I really like that poem. Oh. <laughs> I really like that poem you read about things that your grandmother said, almost like old sayings and things. Um, and like not being about snakes and stuff. And um, part of what I really loved about it was it was so mysterious. You didn't explain it. I have a hard time with my own writing where it's just it's hard for me to just leave it there and trust, you know. And I'm just wondering if you've ever encountered that problem and, and what you do to get past that particular roadblock, you know, that you can get yourself. I definitely have trouble with that still. Um, Rex has a lot of mythology and uh, like place poems, right? Uh, it's really just a matter of trusting your readers, uh, knowing that you, also I tell people to make sure, you know, you may know a certain story uh, or a certain narrative you think is there at home, but you need to make sure it's as clear as possible, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you, like, I could read your poem and I know what happened, right, because I was there, but you need to make sure to read it. So even if you need to change part of the story, make it not true, right? Or the poem, make it not true. Maybe connect with the reader. Also, it's just about trusting them, the knowing that you have smart readers. That's not true all the time, but that's just the... Yeah. Oh, that's really good questions. Okay, I have a question about, well, the second poem you read and then the second to last poem you read. And um, in the second to last poem, uh, which was, I believe, about... Leave yourself all over. <laughs> and there was a line, a question, will you still remember us and our jerry-rigged lives? So you were putting that question to your grandmother. And it reminded me of a line in the second poem you read, which was a poem about childhood. And I think it was, you were talking about a child, your child's position. You said, always had to think of others first. And what struck me as similar or related was that, I guess, a certain reversal and susceptibility. I mean, what does it mean when children have to think of others first? And what does it mean when you're wondering whether the dead will remember the living? There's a kind of reversal. Of so that poem that I read, uh, Tones for that line, so that line is supposed to literally be turning death into a person. Like death was never a child, right? And always had to think of others first. Like death has never had a chance to be a child. Uh -huh. uh, and literally, right, as death does, things for other people. Um, but I like, I like uh, this, like this, these two juxtapositions you're bringing up. Uh, I don't know. That's pretty interesting. I. What does it mean for the dead? We're be worried about whether the dead will remember. Uh, so for me, uh, the dead are my obsession, as you can tell, my poems. Uh, also, this is, this is because, you know, people in my family, my grandmother and my uncle, I write a lot about had passed away very early in my life when I was like six, right? Uh, and so they, they, I they died at a time where, you know, they came to wrong with mine. So now they, I grew up, they grew up with me as like these superhero figures, and now they're just in my poems. And also, I'm an ancestor worshiper, right? I believe in worshiping my ancestors. Uh, and so, for me, that poem is about asking a grandmother, uh, once they moved on, though the speaker of that poem is constantly following her back, once they moved on, will they still, I guess, remember the ask the day, can they remember, essentially, it's that question. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that helps me. Other questions? Thoughts? Yes. Would you say that you mostly write in a literal sense, or are there any aspects of your poem where it can be open for interpretation of other Oh, definitely open for interpretation. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, that's a really difficult question. Because, like, for me, every magic card in my poems is very real, like that happened, and that is very much true, and it can happen. 
so I don't know. I, I believe in all this magic. I mean, so I guess it is, but I don't know. It's still, I mean, you want to interpret because they're very strange images. I don't really, that's a difficult question to answer. Do you write poems? I have to. Yeah? What, what is it for you? Uh, Do you? You have magic, wait, first of all. You got magic in your poems? I would say, yeah. I mean, after hearing the way how you find it, yeah. Do you believe in that magic? Like it happens or can happen? Yeah. Nice, there you go. <laughs> so in our writing class, we're giving prompts on what to write about. Uh, I'm guessing you don't have prompts, so what? Oh, do you? Okay, that's what I was gonna ask. Do you? How do you figure out what you're gonna write about the story? Do you just write and figure out your favorite ones and kind of put those in the book, or how does that? Yeah, process I write work? a bunch of poems. Uh, I give them to my four people I trust, they tell me what sucks, what doesn't suck, and I go from there. Uh, you want a prompt though? You want to write it down? Do you? I got like some really cool prompts. <laughs> if you want them, you don't have to. I'll just make it as well. It's safe to remember it. Okay, this is the prompt. I'll take a prompt. You'll take a prompt? Okay. <laughs> okay. Who wants to do this prompt? Okay, uh, first, I want you to get all notions of time. It doesn't exist in this poem. I want you to either start a poem, uh, when I was my grandfather's father, I, like, Jesus. Uh, can you fill it in? Okay? So, when I was my grandfather's father, I, like, and then fill it in. You're not concerned with time or lineage or anything, okay? You're literally going to step into this person's shoes. When I was my grandfather. When I was my grandfather's father, I, like, Thank you. Here's another one, okay? Uh, I want you to think of language that you might have heard um, in your family around a dinner table or whatever, right? Um, and I want you to use that language to create a poem, uh, but after every phrase or line that you use, I want you to say the phrase, said the knowing. Said the what? Said the knowing. No. So a line could be, uh, don't tuck your napkin into your, into your shirt at the table, said the knowing. What is the knowing? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so do that over and over. That, that's not really the poem. Whatever happens at the, if you need to revise it, uh, you need to cut out all the said and knowings, okay? Uh, but let's use that as a prompt. That's kind of a, the bones of a poem, and let's see what happens to it, okay? Thank you. Yeah. I love that poem. That was my grandfather's father. Any last thoughts, questions, musings? You all are great. Uh, come hang out. All right. Well, thank you so much.